change at the offering level. The second version uh, that the English department is offering that is done as distance learning, and it is going to use 139 of the 245 approved courses because those are the only ones that have been approved to be offered through a distance learning um, method. This time we'll have Terry and Teresa Trojan in, attached or enrolled in that particular program offering. And in this case, they're going to use entrance rules 7 through 14 of the total of 14. They're going to use progress rules of 2 through 4 of the 4. And once again, all 10 of the completion rules will be part of the program offering definition for the distance program. Let me pause there and see if there are any questions. Hearing none, move on. So we'll, we'll move up and we'll do a, a law degree as an uh, offering example. Um, so there is the uh, JD degree. Um, it has a full-time offering, which requires the completion of 26 units of prescribed courses in the first two terms of enrollment for the student. And they must complete 78 units within no more than four years in order to complete the program. They'll also have, they may also have a part-time offering of the law degree program. It will require the same 26 units of prescribed courses, but they'll give them four terms in which that and they must complete the 78 units within no more than five years to complete the program. So typically, part they have to go to summer school is, is the example we're using. So that's an example of how the satisfactory progress rules our requirements are different between the two programs, even though they must complete the same 78 units um, by, the term, by the end of their study. <clears throat> All right, we'll talk a little bit now about creating a program offering. Were there any questions uh, left over from program versus program offering? Yay. Okay. So in Enrollment 1, um, we will allow administrators to create program offerings from canonical programs. In Enrollment 2, uh, we intend to allow the establishment of workflow for requests to create program offerings from canonical programs. Some uh, faculties or programs may want there to be some form of approval process to, to create program offerings, so that won't be enabled until at least Enrollment 2. <clears throat> We need to talk about lockstep versus sustained programs. So a sustained program offering, um, as we've mentioned before, is there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the canonical program and the program offering. Typically, our undergraduate programs operate this way. Um, the example on the continuum down at the bottom is the Bachelor of Arts in English. We tend to only have one offering of that, although there may be specializations within it, like creative writing, poetry, Etc. Once the new offering, once, once the canonical um, program is established or revised, a new offering will be created. In this particular example, we're saying the last was in autumn of 2010. At the far end of the spectrum is the lockstep program offering. And in, that, in those uh, programs, there's a many to one correspondence between. Uh, the pro oops, we back. So there's a one-to-many correspondence between the canonical program and the program offering. Uh, so you may do this <coughs> to separate um, uh, cohorts that are enrolling at the same time. An example that, that's used here is certificate and .NET development. There will be multiple offerings of it, and for a particular period of time, say for 2011-12, there will be four separate op offerings that differ by location and start quarter. So you could establish, although you need not, you could establish separate um, offerings for each one of those. You can do anything in between as well, so it is a continuum. Any questions on that? Yay. 
Okay, so more information on a sustained offering. It's substantiated at the same time or shortly after that of the canonical program, and it does not ex expire until changes are made in the canonical program. So if there is a, a change in the completion requirements, for example, that is a change in the canonical program and would constitute a new offering. This information gets used down the line uh, through um, any of the degree audit, um, either procedures or programs to know as we refer to it, which catalog they're responsible for or which requirements they're needing to satisfy. Students enroll in and complete the program offering on a continuing basis. That is, this fall, next spring, changes of majors, the new admitted class, um, that, that keeps happening through time. And as we've said, most undergraduate major and minor programs are offered in this manner. Lockstep program is a program which uh, a program offering type which prescribes not only the course requirements, which come from the canonical program, but also the precise sequence in which they must be taken, typically as a beginning and ending term, which may overlap those of other offerings of the same canonical program. So you may have a program uh, that starts in the fall and lasts 18 months, um, and another one that the, has the same requirements, uh, but starts in the spring and lasts 18 months. Those could be two separate offerings of the lockstep program. Lockstep programs result in a more complicated program assessment evaluation for both continuance and for completion purposes. Because it's not just a matter of the courses, it's the sequence in which they take them. All right, that concludes uh, programs and program offerings. Do we have any questions before I turn it over to Mike? All right, Mike, you can go ahead and take over. All right. Can everyone see my screen? That yeah. looks good. Okay, great. I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the time talking a bit about program enrollment and program assessment. Uh, within program enrollment, I want to touch on the differences uh, between admission into the institution um, as, opposed, as opposed to enrolling into the program restriction types, um, as well as with withdrawal from the program. How, how would we not only get the student into the program, but get the students out of the program? Um, so there are uh, some differences between admission into the institution and, and enrollment into a program. At the under, undergraduate level, many institutions admit to the institution separately from admitting to a major program. So students are um, maybe coming from high school uh, into um, a baccalaureate program in a school or faculty. Students uh, would, th would start off by satisfying core edu uh, general education requirements before they later apply uh, to enroll in one, of, one or more of the uh, major programs. Now that is different at the graduate level where admission into an institution and to a program are usually synonymous. So that happens at the same time. And next I want to talk about restriction types. Um, we heard a little bit about different um, levels of restrictions on how or when a student can enroll into a program. Um, we heard a bit about seat restrictions. Uh, we might uh, want to limit the number of students enrolled at a program at any one time. For instance, uh, the cinema school um, might have a uh, limited number of editing bays. So uh, those are tools that are necessary for the program, and we they might want to limit the number of students in there. There are also entrance requirements. Uh, these are more system-evaluated type requirements that the students might need to meet before they can be admitted into the program. It might be a uh, uh, number of courses uh, completed, uh, credits or units uh, completed. So those, uh, those are more systematic, though. 
And beyond that, we, we get into a more fuzzy area where um, some uh, schools or programs might require an application process, something that would be uh, written and submitted by the student into um, the department or the school so that it can be manual, manually reviewed uh, before approval is given for the student for enrollment into a program. And there's a, an additional criteria bucket that's a catch-all for everything else. There might be a, um, an audition process or whatever. And uh, we also talked a little bit about how these different types of requirements might apply to programs. And we, we kind of came up with uh, four different types of uh, programs. We have the open program, which um, it's pretty straightforward. If the student wants to come in, there are no restrictions. So enrollment's all, almost automatic, automatic, and a student would get in. There's, uh, we talked a, bit, a little bit about program, um, limited capacity programs that would have street, uh, seat restrictions, but pretty much nothing else. If, if uh, there is available space for them, uh, the student would automatically be, pretty much automatically be enrolled into the program. And then we uh, have the restrictive program where there might be some uh, interest requirements that's applied and possibly uh, an application pro process or any additional criteria. So these uh, restrictive programs are, um, might have some prereqs or some, some additional criteria beyond uh, seat restrictions that the students will need to meet before they can be enrolled into a program. And last is the selective one where everything, uh, all these restrictions kind of apply. It's the most difficult type of program to maybe get into, a lot of hurl hurdles. But uh, this is you know, what, what we came up with in talking a little bit about restrictions and uh, enrollment into a program. I think the bottom line here is that we've kind of took a look at it at multiple levels and um, we'll uh, build a system to accommodate uh, programs that have no restrictions or programs with more restrictions. Any questions around that? And this is, this uh, slide is a different uh, perspective on it. You know, we have our different types of programs in the middle. Um, the open one is, I, I, like I said, it's no criteria and, um, for admission and no seat limitation. The restrictive one um, might ha have seat uh, limitations, but have admission criteria. The, um, the limited capacity one would have seat limitation, but uh, no admission criteria, and the selective has everything. Okay, we talked a little bit about um, how students get in. We do want to make mention of uh, how students can get out of a program uh, beyond graduation. Um, students can initiate this separation from the institution for one or more terms. Um, withdrawal into, from a program um, might, might require um, advisor a visit or a conversation, but it's a most, like, most likely, more than likely, uh, student initiated. At the uh, undergrad level, withdrawal from a program um, need not result in the withdrawal from an institution. I think that's pretty important. Even though a student might uh, drop a program, um, that doesn't mean they're not continuing their education at the institution because the, there can be multiple reasons for that. Might, the student might be in, enrolled in multiple programs or the student just wants to uh, a few, uh, some time to figure out which program they want to focus on. Any questions about program enrollment before I dive into the last big area of topic? Uh, so I'm going to jump into program assessment and talk a little bit about, uh, give more examples of uh, satisfactory progress, completion requirements, and the concept of uh, exemptions against all these. Um, Steve has t uh, defined uh, satis satisfactory progress and completion requirements, but we'll get into some examples. Uh, program assessment. It's an uh, ongoing evaluation of a student's progress towards meeting uh, the requirements of a program. Um, 
and it can happen at all, all levels. Um, it can be defined at the institutional level, at the college uh, faculty level, departmental level, or even at the uh, program level. And like Steve said, if it's, uh, it's rule-based and if it can be defined by rules, it can be um, assessed. A uh, few examples of satisfactory progress we have here. Uh, we identified um, minimum institutional GPA. We've um, heard of, you know, the 2.0 GPA minimum requirement. Um, minimum units enrolled per term. We don't want a full-time student to um, enrolling in zero uh, units. Um, they, there might be some requirements around the how many units they need to be enrolled in to have that designation of a full-time student. Maximum time allowance. Now, uh, some programs might have um, a requirement where they need to complete the program within five years or ten years, and that needs to be tracked. Benchmark requirements. Um, some programs might require students to have completed uh, so many units within their first year, within their second year, or taken so many a certain class um, or course within a certain year. And of course, you know, we have the GPA, the program GPA um, minimum. And all these um, minimums and uh, progress checks will, if they're not met, would uh, flag um, for some action by the administration. Okay, I'm going to jump into completion requirements, and we're um, Steve and I are at uh, USC, and we kind of took some examples from uh, USC, USC's uh, catalog. But this is uh, what we saw as completion requirements for uh, general education. Um, I'm, after this slide, we're going to use the biology major as our example. But in general, um, there are course requirements uh, that can be of specific category. So a student might be required to take two courses within social sciences and history, and one course in history, one course in social sciences. So these kind of requirements can be defined. Um, also, there might be a requirement for three courses in literature with one of each from literature, arts, and the humanities. And then we have more general core requirements, such as three courses in fundamental studies or three math and sciences courses. And um, so, like I said, we're going to use biology as our example here. But uh, as you can see, the uh, completion requirements for the major uh, can be a bit more specific, where we require a student to complete um, either or a uh, couple of courses with a minimum grade of a C. So for ex first example, we have uh, the, um, the student re being required to complete the Math 130 or the Math 140 course with a minimum grade of C. Or uh, they might, the, the student might be required to take a uh, um, series of courses with a minimum of C, such as Chem 131, Chem 132, and so on and so on. And in the last example, we have a number of courses that uh, the student have a choice of taking, but they're specific courses, so they must complete, um, I guess, is our history, <laughs> well, 105, GEM 10, um, and so they have a choice of these four or five courses, but uh, they would have to take one of them and receive a minimum grade of C. So it, hopefully this gives you an example of uh, uh, what we are, what we mean when we talk about requirements. Uh, within the biology major, we picked a specialization, uh, general biology, and we have uh, similar requirements, completion requirements here. And as the student is progressing through the uh, program, uh, we have uh, um, 
the ability to kind of flag certain students for exceptional performance. I am hearing an echo. Please mute yourself if you don't if you don't have any questions. Uh, for instance, we have uh, we have identified dean lists, um, so exceptional performance within a term. We have uh, departmental honors, exceptional performance within a specific department, um, and we have uh, graduation honors, so exceptional performance throughout your uh, time uh, of in the program, and we have the different levels of exceptional performance supported. So the concept of these concepts concepts are we're we're aware of it and. Um, support for it is scheduled. The last thing I want to talk about is program exemptions. Um, definitionally, they are um, persisting time-based grants for an exception to a given policy, which usually invalidates some form of block. So it applies to um, uh, the prereqs, the completion requirements. So these exemptions uh, can be initiated by the student instructor or uh, advisors um, and I uh, we we do plan to have uh, exceptions go through a workflow process uh, later on in uh, our scheduled um, releases of a quality student but yeah there even though we allow administration to define these rules <clears throat> there are some um, there's a built-in system to kind of grant exceptions for those rules And I think that concludes our program. Um, any questions, any additional comments from Steve, Carol? Actually, <laughs> give me a few seconds to um, set up my screen. I'm going to want to share it because I want to do something um, with the completion requirements and curriculum management. So give me about oh, two good, or three good, good. You have one question screen set up. In the meantime? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Um, the SAP requirements, are those granular enough to um, manage um, NCAA satisfactory progress? You know, I don't know yet whether we're actually going to do – this part of our design, it was part of our requirements building initially to, to look at NCAA um, eligibility. You know, I don't know that we'll build it out in E1. But it certainly can accommodate the evaluation of NCAA eligibility. Which is whether the rules will actually, whether it will actually be built out or not is, is a separate question. Do you think you so, may recommend that um, institutions use um, NCAA, CAI? Right. Is it the question? Um, do you think you'll just recommend that um, institutions use the NCAA software, the compliance assistance? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know that we have a recommendation yet, actually, to be honest. Um, so it's a good question. It's noted, and I think when we when we get there, we should probably either make a recommendation or, or uh, be clear about what we've done. So I don't know yet. Yeah, okay. 